Thanks very much, Joyce. It's really an honor to be back here and with all of you conservationists. I'm going to start with something that might be considered a little cheesy, but um, I can really remember the moment when I fell in love with parrots. And I was just a young boy. My mum tells me I was five. A friend of our family had parrots, and uh, he had a collection of birds, and I just was infatuated with yellow budgerigars, we'd call them. I think you call them parakeets. Not knowing what they were getting themselves in for, my parents got me a pair, and very quickly this, this escalated. Um, at the age of eight, I had my first pet parrot, Marmaduke, um, a real parrot, and um, very soon, by my early teens, I had a collection of birds myself, and I had, was breeding several species in the back garden, and um, I'd taken over half of the back garden with my aviaries at that point. It got, the birds got bigger and bigger, and it wasn't long before I had my very own pet macaw. This was Wilbury, a red and green macaw. Wilbury and I were very close. As far as she was concerned, I was her mate. And, and it told me a lot about pair bonds in parrots. I had a girlfriend at the time, so it was a little bit problematic. And if I interacted with my girlfriend and I was in the same room as Wilbury, then Wilbury would just scream the house down. <laughs> Macaws are some of the most iconic of all birds. This is the great green macaw. Responding to her partner's call, Mrs. Parrot leaves the eggs that she's been incubating and will fly to join him in a nearby tree and there he'll feed her. The great green macaw is not one of the best known species. They're not that, um, they're not that popular uh, in the Americas or even in Europe. You, I expect, are probably more familiar with the scarlet macaw. Well, I like to set the tone early and say that for me, these, these are like an American corvette. They're <laughs> colorful, they're loud, and they scream, look at me. <laughs> the great green macaw is more subtle. It's more sophisticated. <laughs> they don't reveal their beautiful colors until they fly. It's more classy, like a British Aston Martin. <laughs> Imagine for a moment that you're this guy, and you're flying over the rainforest. Wouldn't that be amazing? You would see all these trees, you'd see this nature. It's the kind of thing that little penguins dream about. <laughs> Sadly, the uh, loss of forest, and uh, the combination of the loss of forest and the illegal pet trade has devastated the macaws' numbers. They have gone from hundreds of thousands to just 1,500. And that's, that's a real problem. Now, as, as parents, we're not supposed to have favorites, but uh, the great green macaw is our focal species. Um, but we're also working with the sh those showy scarlet macaws. And they're, they're in great peril in Central America and the, the yellow-naped Amazon parrot. We know they're not a, a macaw. We're using some artistic license with our name. But their populations have plummeted in recent years. And so we feel it's really important that we work with this species. But let's, before we get into the details of those birds and, and the work that we're doing, there's, let's just take a step back. And birds are everywhere. They're very visible. They're, um, there's actually swallows or swifts zipping up and down the front of the building here, and you may have seen them today. Birds are very accessible for people, and so they're often the portal through which people first get exposed to conservation. 
And that's really helpful for us because the macaws are so iconic, they're uh, easily recognizable. And so they're this wonderful flagship for the entire ecosystem. When we protect the macaws, we're protecting this entire ecosystem with, in Costa Rica, there are 250 mammal species. There are 900 species of birds, 400 species of reptiles and amphibians, a quarter of a million bugs, but don't let that put you off coming. The forests are just this wealth of diversity, and we, and yet, there, well, Costa Rica is well known for forest protection and national parks, but there are situations where we have forests where parrots are absent. And, and that's, that's something of great concern to us. First of all, we need to know why that's the case, and we need to track that. And so monitoring populations is something that's a central part of our work. Just last weekend, we held, uh, together with partners in Costa Rica and in Nicaragua, we held a population census of the Great Green Macaw. We had volunteers at 60 different sites. We had no 60 volunteers at 40 different sites, and we uh, attempted to count the parrots. It's very difficult because of the forest, but we have a, a concern that the, the last uh, estimate, which is from 15 years ago, which was 300 macaws in Costa Rica, that we're not totally convinced on that number. And our own counting from September and this recent count gives us concern because we might be looking at more, more, something more in the region of 100 or so birds, 100 to 200 birds. So we're very concerned about that, and that's something that we want to continue developing, continue improving our counting technique. These are a minimum estimate, but still it's concerning. I'll just point out Albert on this photo here. Um, Albert is one of the two, two brothers that work with us, and they're in a mentorship program. We're giving them the opportunity to gain management experience and, and other professional development, which they wouldn't be otherwise able to get in this local area. So they're, they're, him and his brother are key parts of our work. So when we look at the forest, and, and we're saying, well, there's forest without parrots, how... How is that even possible, you might ask? And Well, it's possible because for many, many years, decades, parrots have been traded. For, for the scarlet macaw, it's even centuries because there there's artwork from the 1600s where there are scarlet macaws in Europe. And I think you've, you can all imagine a pirate with a parrot on their shoulder. So parrots have been taken from the wild, and we're very familiar with them as pets. This is a yellow-naped Amazon parrot, and that's, that's me, I think, age nine. Uh, it's just coincidence that I happen to have this photo with a yellow-nape, and, and I'm there with my two wonderful sisters. The yellow-naped Amazon has been traded, this is back in the 80s, and, and, and these were a popular pet even then. We've worked with researchers, and they've shown that the nests of the yellow-naped Amazon, between 60 and 85% of nests are poached every year. So there's a real problem where chicks have been taken out of the nest. When we say poached, we mean robbed. The chicks are taken from the nest and they're to be pets. There's an interesting thing with the yellow nets that those same researchers um, uh, learned during their, their studies in Costa Rica. The birds, the birds have a dialect. So birds in the north sound like this. But birds in the, at the southern end of their range, in the middle of Costa Rica, oh, sound like this. They're, they only go halfway down Costa Rica. But even in that distance, there's a, this distinction. The pairs duet, and it's beautiful if you're into this kind of thing, um, and uh, they make this lovely call. So vocalizations are really important for the yellow-naped Amazon. And unfortunately, it has this remarkable ability to mimic human voice. They're also the most charismatic of all parrots. And this has been their downfall. But how charismatic, you might ask? Well, meet Groucho. <laughs> It's easy to see why they're so sought after. 
They're, they make, you know, they're incredible birds, and so they're very desired as pets. Now, excuse me, <coughs> I have the, the tail end of a cold, I'm afraid, uh, so excuse me. Luckily, gin helps really well. Mm, that's much better. Um, so, uh, I, I'd shown that photo of the birds that had been traded, uh, a bird from the 80s. De these birds have been in trouble for many years, and those our friends, the researchers that had uh, done the vocalization work, also did, did some census work, um, and 12 years ago, the birds were already in trouble. Well, in, in the, the time since then, and actually Sophie in the audience here was involved with the census work, um, since that time, the population has declined by 67%. Now, this is in Costa Rica, and Costa Rica is often thought of as the country of this, this beacon of hope, and yet the, these birds which are protected by law have been collected. Uh, a social study estimated that there may be as many as 140,000 parrots and parakeets in captivity in Costa Rica. So, that's obviously uh, really unfortunate on the population scale, but there's also an individual element to this as well, because most birds are kept in terrible conditions like this. Now, I've had the privilege of getting to know many parrots as individuals, and, and, and I, I've really enjoyed that process, but I found that this is very confronting. Parrots are some of the most social animals on our planet. They're every bit as social as uh, chimpanzees and elephants, and probably as social as we are. Um, and yet, we have a bird here in solitary confinement. The only duet she's gonna sing is with a washing machine. Parrots are incredibly intelligent, as, as Groucho's abilities have shown. Um, parrots also use tools, and yet this bird is in a, in a sensory deprivation chamber. This is quite common to be, for birds to be kept like this in Central America. Parrots fly over the rainforest, and they, or dry forest in her case, and they live a life of adventure, and yet this bird can barely open her wings. So how do we go from a situation like this, <coughs> excuse me, uh, how do we go from a situation like this to one where parrots are thriving in the wild? Is it even possible, you might ask? Well, I can confidently say it is. My earlier work on the Caribbean island of Bonaire involved facilitating law enforcement. The birds were protected, but the police didn't want to enforce the law because they'd be stuck with a bunch of parrots. And so we stepped in and said we'd take those birds off their hands, and that allowed enforcement work to happen. Happen. That, that work was uh, conducted in combination with lots of education work as well, lots of positive, inspiring work. The, this, this particular bird was called Sid. He was brought to us at less than a week old and reared by hand, along with a hundred other parrots and parakeets. And this is him taking flight for the first time as a wild bird. This action has led to a, a dramatic change in the population on this island. There are 350 wild birds, and there are now over 1,300 wild on the island. The population has tripled. Thank you. Now, not all those rescue birds will be suitable for release. This is Pico, one of the captive birds in our flock of nearly 100 birds at Punta Islita in, in Costa Rica. And Pico is part of a, uh, a breeding program where we give these birds, if they're not suitable for release, we can give them the opportunity to contribute to conservation. And the, the idea with our breeding center, of course, is that they produce babies. Now, just uh, note that the, the bird's eye, if I get this laser, oh, that's there. The, la the bird's eye is not even open. I mean, when they come out, when they hatch, they're helpless. And you can also notice the bird's thumb. Oh, it seems I've had too much coffee. Um, they, you can see the, the thumb on the bird, and you can actually see that this is, this is the elbow. It's really remarkable to think of these birds and, and to contrast that with a line of, I think of a, a line of day-old ducklings as they waddle along behind their mum. And you, you know, they're so precocious and so completely different to helpless parrot chicks. It's also remarkable and, and hard to imagine that they turn into these beautiful macaws. But first they turn into monsters. <laughs> Soon enough they're ready to be released. 
And this is both an exhilarating but daunting time for, for me, at least. It's also actually remarkably boring. Um, we, uh, it's nothing like the sort of biblical releasing of the doves. The, you know, we, we held a small competition in our local village and we, we got a, a young lady, a young girl, uh, won, won the opportunity to be the one that pulled the rope and opened the hatch. And, and I think she was probably totally disappointed. Um, the, the birds came out, no, the birds, they didn't come out when the hatch was lifted. It was half an hour before they even came out onto the ledge and ate the nuts. And then, they, so they came out and they're here and they're eating the nuts. And then they went back in and sighed. And, sighed. <laughs> and then you know, it was more than another half an hour and they eventually came out onto the edge. And um, you'll, you'll notice, you, oh yes. Uh, you'll notice that actually you don't kind of see it. The, the birds have got paint marks on their beaks and you'll notice there's a nice little bit of styling with this tail feather. That's to help us identify individuals after they've been released. So we could keep track of all the birds. They did eventually leave, and, when, and that's the really exi exciting bit. One bird leaves and then is, is screaming in joy, we, we presume, um, and then the, the other birds all like jump half out after them, and it's, it's just really, really fantastic. Now, prior to release, we, we train the birds on, on different foods, and, and so that they, they know what foods they're going to find in the environment. Um, if they were a wild chick that hatched with, with, its, with its parents, that bird would uh, get an incredible education with its family and it would learn where the foods are. Um, our birds don't get that and I, and I compare that to my own quest for the ultimate chocolate brownie. So I, I know what I like about a chocolate brownie. I want a, a certain amount of crunch but not too much of course. Uh, I, I want a, a certain amount of squidge and it, it obviously it has to be with vanilla ice cream. And even though I know this and I, I'm quite convinced there'll be a very good chocolate brownie somewhere in this area, um, that doesn't mean I know where to find it. And so that's very much the same for parrots when we reintroduce them to an area. So we have to support them and we give them supplemental food. This is a safety net. You just watch on the left for the one flying in, I think. Here we go. This is a safety net uh, which helps to support the birds while they build up that mental map of the area, the local area where, where they're going to live. And they get to know where the trees are and the food. Releasing any animal is very easy. It's, all you have to do is open the doors. But if you want the animal to survive more than a day or two, then it's an, awfully lot, an awful lot more complicated. And um, this, this is a key part of establishing a population in an area, and that's, that is a, a stepping stone to success. Success is when those birds establish and breed. And we've put nest boxes up around the area, and this, this is me checking, checking a nest box where one of our captive bred released, a pair of our captive bred released birds are now nesting. And I'm 60 foot up a tree here trying to check the nest, and they apparently didn't want me to go in the nest. <laughs> They, they actually kind of wanted to rip my face off. Um, now, this particular nest box is right in the middle of the village. It's above the football field, which is the center of any good Costa Rican village. And um, what's wonderful about this is whenever we, we go and check that nest, and, and you can see um, the, that's my rope. I'm somewhere up here, I think. Um, the community come out, and they see what's going on, and they, they learn about the chick, <laughs> the chick's development. So it's a really, really great um, outreach tool. And up there with me was this beautiful young bird, somewhere between monster and utterly gorgeous. Um, and just a month or so after this, the chick had fledged, and here it is being fed by its parents. The reintroduction program gives us this remarkable opportunity to give the local community close encounters with wildlife. We have these feeders, we have these nest boxes, and it's great for local kids, and it's, it gets everybody involved with, with our work. They're very happy, of course, to see the scarlet macaw return to their area. The, um, we, as this chick was the first chick to hatch in this area for over 70 years, we gave the local kids the opportunity to name him. And we thought, you know, we'd get a Latin, nice Latin name like Antonio or, or Pablo or, um, you know, St. Carlos. But they, they, they named him Patrick, uh, which sort of <laughs> threw us a little bit. <laughs> we, 
When we work with the parrots, our ambition is to boost their numbers, to, to bring them, take them safely away from the edge of extinction. When we work with the local community, our ambition is to safeguard the future for the parrots. The great thing about working where we do is we have uh, Costa Rica is just great, great for working with community there. Everybody's really engaged. And so we can get the local kids over and show them, uh, show them the work and, and everybody really, really likes it. And this is my wife, Sarah, on the right. And uh, she's not very ethical. So when the kids came to visit, she made them all work. And they, <laughs> here they are uh, making toys for the, for the captive birds, which we use for enrichment. So it keeps them, keeps them busy. And you know, they, they all seem to really love it with the exception of the girl on the right who's having none of it. <laughs> Sarah's really great. She, she loves working with people. I like birds. But one of the most surprising things for me has been working uh, with my team and finding that um, how rewarding it is to support them in the things that they're deeply passionate about. And of course, collectively, we get so much done. And it's, it's been a real surprise for me, I have to say, because I, I of course, got into this because I like, I like birds. But Sarah, Sarah isn't so, so uh, in, in such a box. She, she likes working with people. And as well as working with the kids, she worked with the kids' parents and other artists in the village. And they've developed a really nice art program where the, the local artists will sell their art to art, the visitors who come on our tour. And, um, and now that's an, an important source of income for the local village. We have some of this art on our table just outside the, the theatre uh, if you're interested to support those local artists. If we're going to safeguard the Great Green Macaw, we need to protect the forest. Unlike the scarlet macaw and the yellow-naped Amazon, which can both cope with somewhat degraded habitat, the Great Green seems to like more continuous forest. If you look here, I've tried to ramp up the saturation. You can see some purple trees. And these are mountain almond trees. The crown turns a remarkable purple as it flowers. And, um, and then, the, the, then it produces these um, incredibly tough nuts. The great green macaw has evolved to eat those nuts. And the nuts are the primary food source for the parrots. The parrot with the biggest, strongest beak is the parrot that can open the most of these tough nuts. But the tree that produces the toughest, hardest nuts is the one that has the most seedlings. So there's this evolutionary arms race going on. And that's what's led to the great green macaw having such a, a massive head. Um, the scarlet macaw is, is actually physically much smaller I mean, on a relative scale. And, and the scarlet macaws can't open these mountain almond nuts. Young birds have to learn how to crack the nuts. And I thought it would be fun to give some of our young birds some mountain almonds to experiment with and, and to learn. So they have to drive their lower mandible into the seam like this, but they have to work that out. And it takes quite a lot of practice. Sometimes your right foot is better, or sometimes your left is better. It takes a lot of concentration, and it may take all your strength. It's hard enough on your own, but when someone is trying to steal your nut, and they're very persistent, sometimes it's just not worth the effort. Now watch the second bird, the bird on the, from the left, and listen. That's the click. They've got the, the nut open. And if you look in its mouth, you'll see the brown kernel of the, the nut. Wait one second, its beak. There it is, sticking out on the right. So it takes a lot of practice, but they can, they can, can I, yeah, oh, sorry, again. <laughs> the mountain almond tree, is a remarkable tree. They're giants. They're 180 feet tall. They tower above the canopy. And they're really uh, just amazing trees. You may not have noticed, but um, here is a fully grown human. 
In Costa Rica, 92% of great green macaw nests, the known nests, are in mountain almond trees. Now, parrots are lazy. Uh, they don't make a, a classic bird garden, like a garden bird nest, like you might think of, like a robin or something with, where they collect twigs. They use a, a pre-existing cavity, a hole in the side of the tree where a branch may have fallen off. And um, those, those birds, the great green macaws are, are big birds, so they need big cavities in the big old trees. Monitoring nests is something that we're doing a lot of now, and our team is spending countless hours in the field watching nest trees like this one. We're tracking the success of those nests and trying to see what factors affect it. So if we find that snakes are predating eggs, chicks, or even incubating females, we can protect the nest against snakes. If we find that chicks are dying young because they're not getting enough food, we can manage that as well. Here, a female returns to her nest after being fed by her partner. The male and female are totally dependent on one another to raise their offspring. It's really a team effort. The male is out foraging for food for himself and his partner, and she's in the nest incubating the eggs. Later, he's foraging for him, his partner, and the chicks, and she's brooding the young chicks. It's remarkable how she has to really climb to get in this nest. And you can see how it was a branch once that fell away. So the males and females look the same. They're sexually monomorphic. They, they are going to pair for, make, they make long-term pair bonds. They may be together for 30 or 40 years, potentially. We don't actually know exactly. But they don't really seem to have a need to show off. It's a, it's a team effort. The, to just to contrast that, the opposite end of the spectrum is the peacock. <laughs> okay, the classic example, very colorful male. The female is a drab brown peahen. What he's saying... He's got this big tail, and he's saying, I've got so many resources, I've got such good genes, I can invest in this huge tail. And, and when I, I can roam through the jungles of Asia with this incredible inconvenience, because they, they're not only found in the gardens of British stately homes. <laughs> he says, I can roam around the jungles and I still don't get eaten. And so she says, oh my goodness, yes, you're a tail. It's just amazing. And so she gets his genes, let's say, and that's all she gets. She has to do all the work. She has to incubate the eggs and, and help rear the chicks. It's very different for the, from the, the approach the parrots take. With parrots, this is the result. After nearly three months of raising the chicks, the chick will start to peer out of the nest tree. This particular bird is very fortunate because he's got a whole load of canopy to crash land into. Many chicks, would you like me to answer that? Many chicks, unfortunately, are coming out of nests which are surrounded by pasture. So this is a nest tree, and up here is the nest cavity. So it's a very, very different situation for a chick in this nest. And this is the view from that nest, looking down at that tree log over on the, on the left. For a young chick that's never flown before, this must be terrifying. And suddenly it makes sense why penguins don't fly. Most years, there's at least one chick that hits the net, hits the ground, and that's basically game over for that bird. Last year, when it happened to Reginald, who came out of that nest, um, it could have been game over, game over, but we were very fortunate that we've built good connections with the landowners in the area, the landowners where there are parrot nests, and we were informed very quickly about the fact that Reginald was, uh, he wasn't called Reginald at that point, but uh, Reginald was, was in need of a rescue. So our team um, worked to improvise a, uh, I should have given this a fancy name, uh, we made a platform which we could hoist up into the tree, and we popped the chick on there, and remarkably he, he did his part and stayed up, stayed on there, and uh, we, had, we were concerned he might just jump off, of course. But um, the parents got the idea as well, and so the parents flew into the tree with this strange platform and, and their chick, and they were reunited, and then they later flew off together. So that, that lucky chick had a second chance. Thank you. I've said already, Costa Rica is like this beacon of hope. But the loss of forest, even in Costa Rica, has been dramatic. Um, 
since the 1950s, half of the, the, the tropical Caribbean forest where the great green macora is found has been cleared to make way for pasture that supplied the booming fast food industry up here in North America. And yeah, that includes Canada. Um, more recently, there's, there's a, a growing concern about uh, pineapple monocultures. These are essentially deserts to any, uh, any wildlife. Since 2000, since the year 2000, uh, well, there were 7,000 acres of pineapple in the year 2000. There's now 55,000 55, acres of pineapple in this region alone, with as much again elsewhere. Now, some of that um, has been a conversion of, of pasture, but there's also been a legal clearing and, and a study has estimated that 725,000 trees have been cut down illegally to make way for, for this monoculture. This is actually on the way to our field site. While out in the field one day, I snapped this photo of a truck, not really thinking too deeply about it. It just seemed like my idea of a horror movie scene. And um, we later found out that there had been illegal logging in this area on, on that day, around that time. And, um, and this photo has now been used as evidence uh, against the illegal logging. And that... Hmm, thank you. Illegal logging, uh, well, logging of any kind is a, is a great concern, and particularly for the mountain almond, because the mountain almond tree, these giant trees, they've, they've got incredibly hard wood. It's so hard that it's resistant to termites. In, before the 1980s, it, you would spend more time sharpening your chainsaw than cutting the wood. It was only with the introduction of carbon steel that it became economically viable to fell the trees. Since then, 90% of the, of the mountain almond trees in Costa Rica have been, it's been estimated that 90% have been cut down. They're now protected, but what we're finding is these trees are standing alone and surrounded by pasture, and they're falling into ill health like this, and, and then they're, they're dying. So we have a situation where every year there's less food for the parrots, and then slowly but surely we're losing these old trees. Old is interesting because it's very vague and I have to be careful here but um, from my perspective at least in human terms 90 seems like a good innings it seems like quite old um, but when we think about trees I mean this is a this is a, an ancient tree it's uh, the cavity is is humongous it's six feet deep the parrots climb all the way down and and obviously this tree is is very very old the mountain almond tree has a lifespan of 650 years and that's kind of a, a throwaway thing, but if we think about that, that means that, it, let's say this tree is that old, or getting close, that means it was a seedling in the 1300s. That means that by the time Columbus arrived in the Americas, this tree was twice as old as anyone's grandma ever was. By, well, uh, she, th th I like to think of this tree as an individual, so I'm going to call it she, because I don't like to call it it. She would have been, you know, ambivalent to the fact that uh, Leonardo da Vinci painted the Mona Lisa. She wouldn't have cared that um, Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel on the ceiling. Uh, she probably didn't care much for Shakespeare. She would have been over 300 years old when Europeans arrived in Australia, when the dodo went extinct, and when America was founded. She was over 300 at that time. In her golden years, she saw the evolu uh, Industrial Revolution. Wallace and Darwin came up with the theory of evolution. And by the time Armstrong and Aldrich walked on the moon, the full moon had shone on her leaves 8,000 times. In the time I've been talking today, a human with a chainsaw could have cut her down. And that doesn't seem right to me. The primary forest is made up of ancient trees. That's what makes it so special. Trees like Jane are not unique. And so deforestation is extremely tragic. And I think we don't really appreciate just how tragic it is. We could easily end up in a situation where we have virtually no ancient trees left. And that, for me, alone is a moral reason why we need to protect the primary rainforest. But there's this little issue of climate change, you might have heard about it. 
That drives food security, which drives human migrations, which is a contentious issue right now. So whichever way you look at it, protecting forests is a good thing. I mentioned the pineapple is on the way to our, our farm. <coughs> Excuse me. The, just five miles away from our farm, this is where our, our team are based right now. And this is Parrot Central. We're re, re, um, renting a building on this farm. We have a great green macaw nest in our front garden. We have a great green macaw nest just five minutes walk from our house and two more that are also in walking distance. There are many others nearby and with, there are only 30 active great green macaw nests in Costa Rica in this northern region where, where the wild birds are. So this is a really important piece of land. This is three quarters of, of the farm is primary forest. We've got tapir tracks running through the forest that we've seen. We've seen prints that we think are puma. We don't think they're quite big enough for jaguars. There's anteaters. There's, oh, there's a river running through it. There are otters. It's just an incredible place and it's peaceful. You don't hear any mechanical noises when you're there. I've visited this place and then I went home and within 24 hours Sarah had banned me from talking about the farm for another week because I was so into it. I'll not say anything else other than we are looking to secure this land and to make a land purchase. If that's something that's of interest to you, if you want to leave a legacy like this, then please come and talk to me afterwards. So, at the McCall Recovery Network, we're monitoring, managing and protecting wild parrots and we're also doing captive breeding to reintroduce birds. Those actions are to boost the numbers of the macaws. We're working increasingly with community outreach. And we're, we now, uh, we're a new, new and small organization, but we hire five Costa Ricans on our team, five, five employees. We're, community is a big, important direction that we're going in. But we're also very excited to get involved with habitat protection. These are actions that we see as safeguarding the future. The choice of our new name, the McCall Recovery Network, was intentional, a network in particular. We draw on an international network of experts, and that includes the WCN, other conservationists, researchers, and business experts. And that helps us develop what we're doing. We're ambitious, we want to develop best practices in what we do. On the ground, working with the birds, we're also working with networks, we're working with partners in other countries. And with the Great Green Macaw, which ranges from Honduras to Ecuador, just one example, we've already worked with partners in Ecuador, Colombia, and in Nicaragua. Our network has the know-how, we have the skills to implement conservation action. We need help to put those actions in, into practice on the ground, and that's where you can come in. I'm, I personally can't wait to see the recovery of these populations and to see them thriving again. I'm not going to stop until we achieve that, and I hope that you'll join me on this journey. Thank you.